Hello, my lovelies. I'm Jenny O, oh, the author with no last name here. And today, after a very long absence, I'm going to talk about Star Stable Online and how not to make an MMO. It's important to note here that I'm not only an author, I'm a sometime peer reviewer, a development editor, a fashion designer, and a game dev who has lived in San Francisco. And for one reason or another, all of these are important, so bear with me. I want to put this first. There will be spoilers ahead for Star Stable Online and the original Starshine Legacy games. None of what is happening is the dev team's fault. Please, do not harass the dev team. None of what is happening is the ambassador's fault. They are PR volunteers and aren't paid. Please, do not harass the ambassadors. And when I say this player base of Star Stable Online are children, I mean most of the players are under the age of consent. And from where I sit on the other side of 30, they're children. Children with YouTube channels and big Instagram accounts doing great things, and still children. It's factual, not derogatory. Much of this information is alleged, unconfirmed, and yet paints a very compelling picture, as most of it reinforces each other. For those of you who do not know, Star Stable Online is an online, massive multiplayer game that touts itself as a continuing adventure with your friends. In Star Stable, you can ride horses, do quests, and well, that's about it. The story is single player, you can race against your friends and do the story with with them, but it's not necessary to do anything with anyone at all if you don't want to. Thus, I'm not calling it a role-playing game. There are no factions, there are no character classes, there are no skills or skill trees, and the stat system is a joke as leveling brings about no real seeable change to your character or horse. Star Stable was built and marketed for the 12 to 18 year old girl who loves horses. And since there is a very large drought in the market of both large-scale games oriented at girls and horse games, they have little competition. That is, they have no competition. It's subscription-based. You can buy monthly subscriptions or get a lifetime account. And these subscriptions give you an allowance of 100 premium currency every Saturday. This isn't a lot of premium currency, and we'll get into it later. So why am I making this video? For the last three years, SSO has found itself steadily slipping among the player base into an increasingly bigger and bigger swamp of controversy. The player base made up mostly of children who might have been playing since they were 7 to 11 and anywhere from 10 years to 2 months are increasingly divided into two camps ideologically. This is my observations, not groups they give themselves. One side really believes that Star Stable can do no wrong. It's broken up into camps of, I, I am critical of this game, sometimes destructively so, but the company still can't be wrong, to, SSO works really hard, you should be grateful, and if you can't, go play something else. Uh, when there isn't really anything else of this size or scope in the horse game genre. So, okay then, not helpful. To this extreme player of white knighting, all criticism is basically salt, hate, or chalked up to immaturity, completely invalidating the genuine frustration and concerns of those putting out their critique. It does not help that Star Stable Public Relations, and even some of their employees, use the exact same language and encourage the destructive defending. Thus, they set up their players, in their player base, against each other. Recently, Star Stable PR even told a player if she needed a break from the game, they'd support her, and they would be happy to see her if she ever came back. Huh? Don't do this. No PR team should ever tell a player they can leave. This boiled down to shut up and leave if you don't like our game. And how arrogant to think if she ever came back. Because if I was told that, I wouldn't come back. 
the when would be never. That is when Star Stable isn't deleting any critique given to them, claiming harassment, abusive language, and hate speech. This has been going on since at least 2016. But both of these types being on the same side, the defending critiquers and the destructive defenders, makes the other side really murky. Those types are the white knights. They are going to defend SSO to their last breath unless they have a come to the light moment and wake up. And if these white knights also offer critique, if you're on the other side, you don't know if they're your allies or not, and suddenly you're in an argument and been blocked. Okay, good job. Curate those socials. You do know I can see the blogs on other channels, right? <laughs> the other side, while they may not be openly critical of SSO, or they are extremely critical of SSO to the point of attacking the PR people and any devs in the open, is people who understand SSO is a company made up of people. They make mistakes. These mistakes can be fixed. There will be a range of actually understanding the game industry on both sides, but the White Knights tend to view anything that the critiques of SSO say, unless the White Knights are the ones saying it, as destructive and unfair to SSO. Again, salt, hate, immaturity. Yes, one of the most critical people of SSO is also one of the ones who will defend SSO to their last breath and says, you can't say bad things because it's not helpful, even though they've said exactly the same type of bad things or worse. Is this hypocritical? Absolutely. Is this person a child? Technically, no. Not anymore. The drama has come to a head. The company has been exposed, so to speak. Fortunately, there has been no I told you so's between the sides. One side is too tired, and the other side doesn't want to believe it. It's lies! Lies, I say! This is the first time I've seen the player base actively angry enough to try to get management's attention by going on a very soft strike. So how did we get here? What is the story behind Star Stable Online? And why is the player base so devoted? To really understand Star Stable Online, we are going to have to go back in time for a very brief history of games for girls and MMOs. Somewhere in the 1980s to early 1990s, when video games just started to get popular, the big gaming companies like Electronic Arts decided they didn't want girls as customers. Video games, I guess, because they involve computers and math and consoles attached to your TV were solely the purview of boys. When employees pointed out that girls like horses and there were a lot of horse sports, they were told, we don't care about girls. Well, along came Christmas 1997 and Barbie Riding Club, which did outdid every other game that Christmas. Girls were hungry for video games. This, unfortunately, didn't change the mind of CEOs. Barbie Riding Club eventually became Barbie Horse Adventures in 2003, and the last horse-themed game Mattel put out was Barbie Riding Camp in 2008, and it was developed by Pixel Tales and distributed by Activision. This is important later. But let's go back a little. In 1994 to the very early 2000s, a real-time strategy games were all the rage. Warcraft, Starcraft, and Command and & Conquer dominated the local area networks of your local colleges, and along with first-person shooters like Unreal Tournament, or what passed for nerddom fun for males and females, on a Friday night when they snuck into the computer labs, or gathered together in their dorm rooms to plug into the college's network and socialize while they tried to slaughter each other in Azeroth. Real-time strategy games had their own inner chat system so you could taunt your fellows as you played, or collaborate with your allies. And then came, along came the first 3D MMO that really made any waves, EverQuest. EverQuest was a glorified chat room with some story tacked onto it. Important. And in 2004, sometime between my first college and my second college, out came World of Warcraft, the MMO that set the standard for all future MMOs due to its popularity, 
an addictive nature. World of Warcraft was built over five years, the first test being made using Warcraft 3 assets, and had a team of roughly 65 people making it. It opened up with at least 2,000 quests. It had a solid foundation of story from Warcraft Orcs vs. Humans to Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos to draw from. No, scratch that. Okay, for a minute we have to go back to the obscure development of Warcraft Orcs vs. Humans. Here is some alleged information that I've stumbled across while researching MMO development. Warcraft 1, for the sake of simplicity, wasn't originally conceived as its own original IP. Original IP is risky. Many times publishers don't want to consider it, especially for an early release from their studio. It was actually started as a digital, real-time strategy game for Warhammer. The literal real-time strategy game. For the game Warhammer, aficionados built and paint armies of little miniatures in their own 3D table-sized environment and then get together with other miniature lovers to set their armies against each other and roll dice to see who wins. It's like Risk, but for those who love D&D. There were even Warhammer-themed stores where you could go in and buy lore books and miniatures and participate in official tournaments. And then it's as expensive as you'd expect, and man, they didn't like me wandering in to poke about. For some reason, no one asked if I needed any help. Huh. I wonder why that was. Oh, right. Games Workshop started the development of Warhammer in 1983 and managed to keep it going until 2015. By 1992, when Warcraft 1 was in development with Blizzard, they were on their fourth edition. But somewhere between, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this on a computer, and actually seeing their game on a computer, Games Workshop got cold feet and pulled out of the project. But by this point, Blizzard, you could say, was invested. They had a bunch of code and some assets, and they decided instead of scrapping the game, they'd thread the needle of IP and copyright and make their own version of Warhammer change the names and some of the lore, and thus we got Warcraft 1. To sum up where we are, Warhammer wanted a video game. They contracted Blizzard and got cold feet. Blizzard went ahead anyways and released Warcraft 1. Warcraft 1 started a wave of real-time strategy games that lasted until the MMO started dominating the scene in 2004 when they released World of Warcraft. Blizzard, the company that makes their previous games obsolete. And the first MMO was more like a chat room with some story than an actual MMO RPG because WoW set that standard. And from WoW, we got Guild Wars, and everybody started jumping on the bandwagon of MMO RPGs because 65 people decided to build one to compete with Evercrest, and probably RuneScape. Now, MMO RPGs are making huge profits, building huge player bases and basically creating a whole new set of addictions for my generation and the one after me. This is when the CEOs get involved. And the reason why MMOs are so important is because when the CEO saw that these huge multiplayer games were bringing massive amounts of profits despite their astronomical development price tags, they all wanted in on a piece of the action. Big gaming companies, the type that puts games into your Wally world, pretty much stopped making single-player games for the PC, unless it was an extremely established franchise like Elder Scrolls or Assassin's Creed or The Witcher. If you wanted a single-player game, you had to have a console. Also, those three games had something hugely in common with the bog-standard MMO. They were all fantasy combat games. Then, they stopped making PC games almost entirely and went to mobile. And then there was also the rise of the internet browser Flash games. Now we have Steam, and, and most games are downloadable. How did MMOs make such huge money that the PC game industry just abandoned every other type of game? Social grouping. Remember how Evercraft was just a chat room with some story tacked on? 
At the time, there wasn't really instant messaging in all the social media apps we have today. So if you wanted to get together with your friends on the internet, EverQuest or WoW with their in-game built-in chat rooms allowed you to do it. Then they added story crests in Big Boss Dungeons for you to make experiences together. This got you addicted to watching numbers go up because our brains like that sort of thing and doing things with your friends. This produces serotonin and dopamine so we get to like it and we want to do more. Just like the land real-time strategy games and first-person shooters had before them. So they put in a base cost of the game plus a subscription to keep the servers going, and started raking in the cash as people recruited their friends and made new friends and didn't want to let their subscription go because they were having a fantasy life in WoW. It exploded, and here's where the CEO started making choices. They could now choose monetization strategies. Other videos can probably explain this much better than I can. Josh Dry Pace did a video about how Gimigo kills games, and I strongly recommend a watch. Craig of the Lazy Peon, or maybe it was Skylent Games, did a video several years ago about the development of Ashes of Creation and laid out how MMO monetization works. Both Josh and Craig, or Skylent, agree, so let me sum up. Basically, there are two ways to get your MMO funded once it's complete. <laughs> Are MMOs ever complete? One is a short-term strategy, and the other is a long-term strategy. The short-term strategy ends with dead games. The long-term strategy, well, while was still going 17 years later, despite, or in spite, Activision trying to bleed it dry. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> So the long-term strategy of keeping your MMO going is basically what WoW has been doing, and mostly doing well for 17 years. You take your profits of your game, and you turn around and invest them back into your game to improve mechanics, graphics, and add more content. More content includes things like story quests, map expansions, and new mechanics that involve story quests and utilizing those map expansions. This could be things like housing, crafting, or even new races and character classes. If you keep pumping out good quality content on a consistent schedule, and by consistent schedule, every two years at most with a couple thousand quests, you will have a fan base who loves you and will keep throwing money at your product. And if you have excess profit that doesn't need to go into development of the next installment of content, you get to build another game. What? The short-term strategy, often used by greedy CEOs, is to monetize the shit out of a game with microtransactions of cosmetics and exclusive content up to and including highly addictive, to me boring, gambling mechanics in order to make massive profits off of people who will pay to win the game instead of play to win, and they will eventually if not immediately, scale back the game devs to a skeleton crew, and no new content emerges, glitches multiply. The CEOs will go buy themselves a yacht with a new hugely massive profits for a couple of years, and walk away to the next game where they will do the exact same thing. Because it takes a couple of years for the realities of this short-term strategy to kick in and for players to abandon the game which will eventually shut down due to operating costs being higher than profit. Gamers love the long-term strategy and hate the short-term strategy, and what they hate even more is when another company buys out a company employing the long-term strategy and changes it to the short-term strategy, or a shift in management that does the exact same thing. So here we are. It's 2003, a year before the re release of WoW and the death of single player. Barbie Horse Adventures enters the stage, a single player game by Mattel with the theme of equestrianism. They put out two games that September, Blue Ribbon Race for the Game Boy Advance and Mystery Ride for the PC, which meant if you were a girl, 2003 was the best year ever! Finally, a video game for you! 
since Writing Club in 1997 and Mason Ride for PS2 in 1999. And the most wonderful thing about Barbie Horse Adventures is you could work your way through the entire game and get the unicorn without spending a dime more than what you paid for the game? Enter Pony Club. Pony Club is a Swedish book club. They've had a couple na different names over the years, but they were a book club aimed at girls with the theme of horses. Somewhere in the early 2000s, maybe seeing the success of Barbie Horse Adventures, I don't know. Pony Cub contracted out with Oblivion AB to put out a series of four visual novels with some gameplay attached, Starshine Legacy. These games came out in 2005 and at first were only available to Pony Club members, but eventually, somehow, other people got their hands on them. They were distributed by Pixel Tales. Oh boy, and produced by Hidden Tales AB, a startup investor and content developer, and Pixel Tales AB. So there were three companies with about 20 people, as far as I can tell, working on this suite of games. Written by Nils Gillickson and Magnus Cedar, the games gained a small following, and Pixel Tales, along with Hidden Tales, now Hidden Entertainment, decided to continue the IP with a series of four more games this time dancing games about one of the characters of Starshine Legacy, Lisa, in Star Academy. Star Academy was actually very similar to a popular European singing competition show at the time. Either way, all eight games were very short and rather riddled with glitches. This is a theme. But they weren't done yet! In 2008, around the time Pixel Tales was putting out their Barbie Horse Adventures installment, Stammenfeld, Hidden Entertainment, and Penny Girl, the latest incarnation of Pony Club, put out four more glitch-ridden but relatively story-light games in the Star Stable universe, exploring different game mechanics with cameos of popular characters from Starshine Legacy and Star Academy, such as the Soul Riders, the Dark Riders, Lisa's bandmates, and Herman. They expanded on game locations, creating an, an open-world map. The Star Stable seasonal games allowed the player to create their own character. There was once again very light story as the player learned to ride the horse and collect ribbons at races around the game map in order to go to a racing challenge and win the game. In fact, the story was so light that it sort of just ended without resolution at a certain point and you were directed to go win the championship. Subsequent games were even worse, with less and less story, and taking less and less time to finish them. In spring, we were helping set up a dressage riding camp in the Rockville area. Well, we never did find out if it was successful, as we never recruited any NPCs to come to camp. We kind of met Anne and ended up at the dressage competition, and that was that. Same for summer, but a western camp. Each game explored, focused on one aspect of equestrianism in a different section of the map in a different season, though all the assets were simply variations on each other keeping the game cohesive. In fact, they're almost stock. If you look at the assets of Barbie Horse Adventures Riding Camp and Star Staples Seasonal Games, you'll notice they are disturbingly similar, as in, the horses could be identical and the trees and environments are virtually the same. Remember, the NPCs were all ripped, for the most part, out of the Star Sign Legacy and Star Academy. So there are two game styles going on, something rather gritty and realistic, and the NPCs being a cross between anime and western cartoons. In retrospect, it feels like the Star Stable seasonal games were a test to see how an open world would work for their next project. Anyways, there are kind of a lot of interesting gems I could put in here about Pixel Tales, Hidden Entertainment, Originally Hidden Dinosaur, and Stabenfeld AB that, um, let's just say the developers wrote themselves in the game company names into the story multiple times. Like when I was doing the research for this back in 2015, 2016 for my first reviews, and I bought the seasonal games to play, I was simultaneously amused and appalled at the rather blatant insertion of themselves into the lore of Star Stable Online. Honestly, not the point here. That's another video. So Pixel Tales website, still up, says they focus on producing great games with a lean and agile 
workforce. Apparently, something about Star Stable as ascetic games and whatever profit they were making off of them inspired Pixel Tales to decide they wanted to make an open world MMO game with a Star Shine Legacy Star Stable IP. And this went over about as well as you'd expect in the traditional gaming industry. They were laughed at. There were like a few truisms back in 2008. Don't make subscription games, don't make PC games, and don't make games for girls. They ignored it and went ahead anyways. Remember, Pixel Tales model thing. Great games, lean workforce, massive online multiplayer, um, right. Pixel's Tales decided to do it all, even though they'd never made an MMO before. They got a few investors, made a few design decisions, probably to their detriment, and October 2011, aka the first quarter of the new budget year for businesses, Star Stable Online Air Star Server opened in Sweden with recycled graphics and music from the Star Stable seasonal games with a few new assets thrown in for variety, like Moreland Stable, you know, okay, no, Silver Guide really didn't have new assets. There were a few new characters, oh, and they stripped the mechanics out of the game that actually made the Star Stable seasonal games worth playing. The mechanics that made the game and the races actually challenging, up into and including an endurance mechanic, Food making your horse faster and customizing stats on both player and horse. The story picked up a few years after the Star Stable seasonal games. They had an open source engine, a small but dedicated team, and a target market no one else was tapping. And as of 2011, with the rise of social media and the burgeoning popularity of Facebook and chatting instant messaging services, the MMO industry was shifting towards more single-player content, so SSO single-player story and lack of any other RPG mechanics didn't really stand out so much if it was noticed at all. And despite claiming they wanted 8-year-olds, social media constraints and memberships in the game story really geared them towards that young adult 12 to 18 age group, so it worked out well even though they said they wanted the 8-year-olds. It took until 2015, and social media really being a part of everyone's life, for that type of marketing to take off. Okay, my lovelies, I'm going to end the video here for now. Mostly for the sake of my voice and for the sake of time. No one wants to watch, listen to me yammer for over an hour. Next time, we're going to talk about the history of Star Stable Online itself. So... Until the next video, my lovelies.